Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you very much for coming. It's, um, it's six o'clock, we'll so make a start. Um, the idea of these uh, hour conversations or um, talk, um, informal um, exchanges, are designed to make it as informal as possible, as relaxed as possible, and as enjoyable uh, as possible. I know I will enjoy this because I've heard the rehearsal singing and the playing. And, um, and uh, I'm sorry that there are not more people here, but we're not really worried about quantity, but quality. And in time, I'm sure that, um, like all struggling new ventures like this one, uh, we will uh, flourish, I hope. But thank you for coming. Uh, Susie is a very long friend of my, long time friend of mine, and uh, since I've known her, she has grown from uh, being a, a, a sparkler into a star, and then into a, a constellation. And um, there is now nobody uh, more uh, accomplished than her in mastering uh, voices on mass. And uh, I know that um, what she's going to tell us today is going to fascinate us. And uh, if, if we can achieve half of the things or tens of the things that she has, uh, we should be so lucky. But much more importantly, we're here to enjoy what uh, she has done and tell us about it. And um, without further ado, I'm going to hand her over to you. And the format is very simple. After a while, uh, perhaps half an hour or so when she's finished, we'll just open the floor for you to question. And, uh, and um, the only proviso is that you ask her an intelligent question, um, nothing more. So uh, first of all, can you join me in welcoming uh, Susie Digby to the forum today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am a choral conductor and a music educator. I believe passionately in the unique and civilizing force of great music. Great music comes from great minds, geniuses. But these geniuses need an environment in which to flourish. This is why there are periods of intense flourishing of creative genius throughout history. Tudor England, the Italy of Monteverdi that we're going to hear later, Vienna of the late 1700s, the Germany of Schumann and Brahms, one of David's great favorites. And also why there are long fallow periods, such as the Dark Ages in the West. So much has to be in place, not least patronage, education, enlightened leadership, and freedom of ideas, an aesthetic standard by which society can be judged that trumps everything else. The very roots of the tree to the furthest branches of society have to be conducive. Add to that a degree of the hunger of personal ambition, Haydn, for example, and very often personal or historic trauma when individuals tend to dig deep into their creative reserves. And the things in life that create tsunami drive in an individual, and of course, a receptive public. What really matters in life? How can we really live life deeply and fully? A couple of years ago, someone who might be called David Tang came to Cambridge University to talk to the Students' Chinese Society and made this point so brilliantly. The students' pens poised waited for advice from the legendary entrepreneur as to how they should make their fortunes after business school. David said, forget business school, it's useless. Listen to this. And he, replay, he played a recording very loudly of Brahms' third symphony, I think, third movement, it could have been that he was too lazy to write a speech. His son later told me, at the start of the journey to Cambridge, in the back of the car, David had, some, had said something that rhymes with, duck, I haven't written a speech, and promptly fell asleep. But the point he made with the Brahms to the bewildered students was most powerful. What is music? What is the extent of its power on the common soul and intellect? The mystery of music. Nietzsche called it Mysterium Tremendum. It could be the last act of Tristan, or it could be just eight bars or four bars of Mozart. Somehow it makes us feel we are part of a universal soul. What could be more transcendental? 
Music does more than literature can. George Steiner refers to three dimensions which transcend anything possible by the power of word alone. Pure maths, God, and music. Maybe they're all one and the same. The theory of everything. What else can give us such hope of a transcendent possibility than music? It's a terrifying thought to me that it might no longer be an assumed and fundamental part of education. Every educated person should be able to take part in music making of some sort, however amateur, as once was the case in 19th century Europe. To some extent, I see evidence of this in middle class China. I taught music at DGS in Hong Kong, Dahus and Girls School, for 12 years. Chinese children taught in English. Almost all the children learnt an instrument, mostly the piano. I had nine grade eight students. We had nine grade eight students one year under the age of 12. Everyone must have the opportunity to have those regions of the soul touched in a way that only great art and specifically music can. So this brings me to some of the basic questions that we all have the responsibility to contemplate. What distinguishes a civilized society from a barbarous one? Who is the arbiter of this? And do we as individuals, should we have the ultimate responsibility to contribute to the bettering of society? If we decide the answer to this last question is yes, where do we start? First of all, we need to define our roles, or multiple roles, as a parent, as a voter, as a contributor to society via our chosen career or vocation. It seems to me that great music, far from being a recreational frill, is central to these issues. This evening, I'm going to outline my own visions and theories about music's role in our lives, in society, and in education. I like to think of music in three categories. First, functional music. It's a name I made up. Music we are compelled to make, usually through singing, against injustice, to go to war, for ritual, to worship, to unite against a common enemy. We find many examples of this type of functional music in African communities. Formerly in the Eastern Bloc countries, for example, Estonia, oppressed by foreign powers for 800 years, the only way a mother could pass the mother tongue to the next generation was through singing indigenous folk songs to the baby. In England, the only example today of functional singing is on the football terraces. Nobody's told them to sing. Uniting in song is the only way completely to unite and to express a powerfully common emotion. Is there an example of greater communal passion from the depths of one's being than a Manchester United supporter singing against Liverpool. It's certainly the case that the more urban and noisy our world becomes, we hear now more music and noise around us than any other time in human history, the more functional music recedes. My second category of music is recreational music, music composed by mankind for mankind, both popular and high art. The third category of music is universal music, the frequencies and vibrations that make up this universe. Rudolf Steiner said, the human being is musically creative or sensitive music because these sounds are already present in the human being's sen sentient astral body. A sort of music of the spheres, if you like a theory based on mathematical principles, which I'll touch on later. Now, here's a question for you. Does music shape society, or does society shape music? A book by David Tame called The Secret Power of Music fascinated me. I became obsessed with it. After living in Hong Kong for 12 years, and I was the fifth generation born and raised in the Far East, I felt equally connected to the Eastern philosophies as to the Western Enlightenment values. And this is why the book gripped me. In his book, David Tame outlines his theory that music shapes society, and he gives examples. 
In several ancient cultures, music was seen as a force that needed to be controlled in order to keep society from changing. In today's more barbaric regimes, we see the same. Why, for example, does the Taliban ban all forms of music except incantations from the minaret and other tightly controlled religious functions? Because it's a way of suppressing the independence of mind and progress in society. In ancient China, thousands of years ago, the cycle of fifths had been worked out long before Pythagoras, whose comma theory out of the cycle of fifths, which I'll demonstrate later, supported the notion of infinity and perhaps reincarnation for Eastern cultures. Music in very ancient China was strictly controlled to vast massed choirs and strings intoning one of 12 semitones created by the cycle of fifths at one particular time of the calendar. 12 semitones, 12 hours, 12 months. This was the way the human could align himself with the celestial forces. Music was the universe. Legend had it, has it that imperial squads were dispatched to areas of China to prevent other, other self-indulgent, corrupting forms of music making. You could say that this certainly had the effect of stabilizing Chinese society for hundreds, if not thousands, of years to stop it for, from progressing, if you like, to prevent independence of mind. And in ancient India, the Om had a similar function in terms of human alignment with the celestial forces. Much later, Pythagoras, around 500 BC, developed his mathematical theories directly from music. Music, mathematics, the universe, to him, were all one and the same. This has become known as the music of the spheres. Pythagoras identified that the pitch of a musical note is in proportion to the length of string or wire that produces it, and that the intervals between harmonious sound frequencies form simple numerical ratios. He proposed that the sun and the moon all emit a hum, an orbital resonance, and that quality, our quality of life reflects the tenor of celestial sounds. Plato later described astronomy as music. It's worth mentioning here that the medieval quadrivium of the sixth century, that is the four central pillars of education, were astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, and music. What are our pillars of education today? The cycle of fifths worked out by Pythagoras and previously by the Chinese, of course they always chomp us to these great discoveries, is one of the most fascinating discoveries of all mankind. Here is what it looks and sounds like. As you descend in perfect fifths or ascend, you never get back to the same starting point, hence the Pythagorean comma theory. Could continue now.
in the West, medieval... Oh, you don't need that. In the West, medieval monophony, mono equals one, phonos sound. In music, it's a single line or a single voice. Think of it as a soliloquy. Um, and plain chant developed into polyphony, poly, many, phonos, sound. Polyphony can just be two lines, but if you have two lines together, it creates harmony. Harmony required rules, both for elegance and for religious control, because it impacts emotion, both positively and negatively. For example, the tritone, the augmented fourth, diminished fifth, is the most dissonant of all intervals, and it's known to have been banned in certain contexts and referred to as the devil's interval. Today, this can happen in gospel music. A very good friend of mine um, has been excommunicated from the Seventh-day Adventists for playing forbidden blues chords because they create certain undesirable emotive responses. Move forward to Bach now. Bach's well-tempered clavier Mean temperament with Bach was established. With all the pure ratios that we've just seen there being adjusted to fit into the perfect octave. Basically, so you could play all 24 keys without having to retune the harpsichord for each new key. From this point onwards, over the subsequent 300 years, 300 years plus, from 1700 to now, music has come more and more away from the linear with the natural tension release of the melody on the breath towards the sensuous, pleasing to the senses, towards the individual. I suppose the perfect example is the lush and exquisite soundscapes of Ravel and Debussy. Their harmonies, beautiful chords, tonalities, textures, colors dominate. Ultimately, this Western harmonic tonal language was pushed so far Wagner's Tristan chord was the symbolic breaking point that it resulted in the total breakdown of tonality. David Tame's example of how music can change society via the influence of voodoo from Africa, via jazz to rock music, resulted, which was the antithesis of where we began with plain chant and monophony, i.e. the relentless thud of a beat in a rock concert, which excites the system and sets up a reliance on a heightened state to those overexposed to it. This is his, his theory, that this then um, results in a, um, the heartbeat synchronizes, and in a, at a certain level of decibels, even protein can coagulate. If you put an egg on a loudspeaker at a certain number of decibels, it will cook. And hence the need for drugs to recreate this heightened state. So music has a profound influence on us and indeed could be said to shape society before we shape it. So what should be the musical diet of young people to produce a balanced individual? I like to use the food analogy. If you eat a balanced diet of fish, rice, meat, vegetables, fruit, then you can have a Big Mac twice, three times, four times a week. You're not malnourished. If you live on Big Mac, you have a problem. And so uh, with your cultural diet, I feel the soul needs to be nourished in exactly the same way. But the most important thing to say about music in today's world is it is the vehicle by which the greatest creative achievements of mankind reach us. Quite simply it is, to quote George Steiner again, the privilege of being. I want now to talk a little bit about my latest work, safeguarding or attempting in my modest way to safeguard the future of classical music. I had dinner with a leading publisher two nights ago. She told me that the New York Times used to employ over 50 arts correspondents. Now they've reduced that to a number, number to four. This is perhaps the tip of some monster iceberg. What does it imply? What are the ways to safeguard great art, and specifically the future of great classical music in live performance, 
for future generations. And why is it important? We can look at today's 16 to 22 year olds. You probably all have one in your family. Why that ideal demographic? Why should we look at that demographic? Because by 16, we're ready to start forming sophisticated ideas about how we relate to the world. Education, for the most part, falls grossly short. Parents, for the most part, invest insufficient time to redress the balance. When I was 16, it was the Matthew Passion and other seminal works that forced me, both as a performer and a listener, out of my confines. Cultural diets of today's young consists of reality television, YouTube shorts, over-manufactured synthetic pop music. Of course, there is high quality of music of all genres, but it is the exception. Five years ago, I had a light bulb moment. I went to Wilton's Music Hall, I don't know if you know it, in Spitalfields. A singing ensemble called I Fiagiolini, The Little Beans, were performing, wait for it, Talis in Wonderland. You can imagine what fun it was, a new and brilliant way of presenting Renaissance music. My first thought was, my children would love this. My second thought was, they never come to concerts like the way I used to with my father. I used to beg my father to take me to concerts. Then I looked at the packed audience, highly appreciated, all gray hair. There was no one in the audience as young as the oldest performer. I now realize in the late 70s, in many ways, were the glory days of live music performance for a multi-generational audience in cultural capitals in the West. And paradox paradoxically, today, we have ever-increasing numbers of professional musicians at an ever-increasing standard of excellence. We've researched through photographs and whatever data we can, and we estimate that 20% of audiences 30 years ago were in the 16 to 22-year-old demographic. That has dwindled now to 1% to 2%. But to restore the 20%, we must re-engage young people. That is a complex and multifaceted challenge. And should we rest on our laurels? Should we listen to those who claim there is no threat? who see the Albert Hall crammed with young people at the late night, the last night of the proms. Just look at the cracks in America. Orchestras and opera companies closing down. No statutory music in schools. Arts being the first to, to be cut. Complacency is not an option. So I created Vocal Future. The idea of working with that material, which is not spontaneously designed to be a theatrical performance, you have to be inspired. It's like, no, that's your one side, I don't mean to, but I think it's like one that I've always wanted to go to.
young people to be fascinated by great classical music. Our first production, we chose the Mass of Passion of Bach. The reason I chose that piece was that that was the music that really blew me away when I was six, sixteen. And so it seemed to make sense to take a piece that has the potential to really change the way you think about the world. So I designed this scheme for what we call the young ambassadors. There's an induction where the young ambassadors, these are susceptible young people who have never attended concerts or attended very few concerts. They come into the world of the Mass of Passion and start understanding the issues around it and start absorbing the music. What was very interesting was gives you an idea anyway I think that's probably enough for that yeah okay. it gives you an idea and that's um, well. <laughs> the young man the young man went on to say something which just made it all worthwhile he said it was it wasn't hearing music it was experiencing music and he said that unprompted I promise I didn't actually write his script but that to me was was made everything valid I appreciate the reverse trend might be the case in Asia I hope so, although an exponentially speedy morphing of societies across the globe into one massive global reality television, celebrity insane, acquisitive, stream dominated international lava lamp of humanity seems a terrifying possibility. And finally, to music education and neuroscience. There are three disciplines in which there's true child prodigy, true child prodigy. Maths, music, and chess. This proves, to my logic, that these are endemic to the human brain as they relate to the way the brain likes to pattern. The acquisition of these three disciplines requires a spiral of learning, and in the case of maths and music, a methodology and progression of learning. The value of music education, in my mind, is threefold. Firstly, developing our brain. We know musicians are cleverer than everybody else. A subject for another talk. Secondly, the complete personality. I won't go into detail, but we're all aware of the phenomenal value of music in developing basic skills, key basic skills of learning and social integration. Music is the source of balance and tolerance, as the late Lord Menuhin used to proselytize. But these two values of music are essentially utilitarian. The third and most important value of music is the intrinsic one of being close, in close, close, close proximity to great beauty and fostering in developing minds and souls an aesthetic sensitivity. But bad music education, I think, is worse than no music education. If you subscribe, as I do, to the idea that we all have 10 intelligences, 10 intelligences. That's Howard Gardner's theory, of which music is the first. You will agree that the whole child will not develop into a fully in a fully balanced way without a high quality music education. The need to think of the whole child in education is paramount. The lessons I learned in Hungary on my Churchill Fellowship travels back in 1990 which has defined my entire approach to music education over 25 years, is that singing should be at the heart of music education. The Hungarian Zoltán Kodály was the only individual in modern history who managed to convince an entire nation and put it into practice for every Hungarian child that music was central and indispensable in early, early education. Why is it that there are more Nobel Prize winners per capita in Hungary than any other country in the world. It's music education. So the Kodai principles are, music education must start with the voice. The ear can be trained, the heart can be trained long before the child is able to coordinate on an instrument. Two, this process must be from the earliest possible age, even in utero. The ears are fully formed from 11 weeks by the mother singing to the child. 
through indigenous song material, nursery rhymes, folk songs. And thirdly, that this mu there must be a structured, experiential system of learning, not the Sainsbury supermarket approach of a bit of this and a bit of that in your supermarket trolley. That's not music education. There's no mu meaningful music education without instruments, but singing must be the starting point. My Voices Foundation in the UK was formed to give general primary teachers, these are the people that are, are the custodians of our young, day in and day out, the skills and resources and confidence to teach every child the, the, as they teach all subjects. But like literacy and numeracy, music requires a progression of learning and a methodology like phonics in literacy, especially in pre-puberty education. The Voices Foundation has now worked with literally thousands of teachers and millions of children nationwide and has influenced policy. The government, you may not know, gave 30 million pounds over three years to singing in primary schools. Can you give me an example of another country in the world that has done that? And we established a, a music manifesto, unique worldwide, and music is the only subject that has a national plan, thanks to our pioneering work. There are many, many of us, but I can claim we were the real pioneers of it. And um, we are the only organization in the plan recommended to all 19,000 primary schools for their curriculum and singing strategies. It's not a, a government organization. Which brings me l at last to where we stand with 21st century science, and specifically the role of brain imaging in quantifying what we already know um, anecdotally. There's a lot of bandwagoning on bad neuroscience, pseudoscience, by musicians and teachers desperate to prove the unique worthiness of their discipline, which is in the end counterproductive. The Mozart effect, rats go through mazes faster when they listen to Mozart, has been discredited almost as soon as it reached the newspapers. The brain imaging techniques available to us now are still quite crude, but there are some really interesting and credible studies that have underpinned what many of us have instinctively understood. The taxi driver study. Taxi drivers were wired up. The hippocampus, <coughs> which is the spatial part of the brain, was much bigger in the taxi drivers than in the other people that they were tested again of the same age. This is important because it proves that the brain is much more plastic for much longer than we thought. Hugely, huge implications for education. Another study. The right hemisphere of the brain is the creative side, largely. The left brain is largely the logical side. We now know that the right brain grows faster than the left up to the age of seven. What does that tell us about education? The Scandinavians been, have been right all along, and the Hungarians. You don't test children young. You give them experiential, play-based, structured learning. And the third bit of very interesting research is singing and speech. Singing is a right brain activity. Speech is a left brain activity. That's why when stroke victims lose their speech, they can sing and be re-educated back to language through song. That's why stammerers don't stammer when they sing. So brain imaging has helped. But I think we deny music education to our children at the greatest peril to humanity. When I, established, when I established my bottom line for my children and my pupils, it took me years to work out what was my bottom line. This is what, the, what I came to. Number one, they should be able to think independent of consensus. Number two, they should respect all others. And I think having, having a bottom line helps clarify and focus one's contribution. Certainly music is central to developing those qualities. Going back to the question I asked at the beginning, who is the arbiter of a civilized society? It is, of course, each and every one of us. And now I'll leave the, first, the last word to the music itself. Um, I created the London Youth Choir two and a half years ago, which is 350 children in five choirs from all 32 boroughs. At the very top of the pyramid, so from eight to 22, at the top of the pyramid are 16 choral scholars. And um, we have with them tonight one of my students, Isabel, and she's going to sing 
for us and to leave us with the, 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 those parts of the soul that only music can reach. Isabel and Harry.
Well, um, first of all, I want to thank um, Susie Digby, uh, but I want her to stay on for a minute because um, some of you might have questions. I, I have one question or two questions. But um, before that, I have to thank Harry and uh, Isabel for that wonderful interlude. Uh, it's not every day at 6.30 we hear heavenly sounds like that. And um, will you please join me once more in warmly thanking them for um, lifting our evening tonight. <laughs> First piece was Bach, I gather, and um, Monteverdi is the second one. Right, good. All right. Well, look, um, before I ask my question, is there anybody in the audience who's got a burning question for uh, Susie? Yes. You seem to be saying that song is the um, answer in terms of um, arresting the decline I mean, in classical music interest audiences, however you want to put it, which sounds very plausible to me, and you laid out very convincingly that you've done a lot yourself in schools uh, in that way. What's the crossover, really, though, between singing, where you can clearly be very successful, and the broader um, uh, sense of uh, not understanding of classical music, because that's not the right think, way to think about it, but feeling for it, appreciating for it. Um, uh, I'm not sure where the crossover comes. Um, so it'd be interesting to get your view on that, because there's a huge job of work to be done, obviously, massive. Um, which goes way beyond the, the vocal side of it. Maybe I'm misunderstanding the. I the think do I ans understand your question that um, um, the use of the voice as the medium of music education? How does that translate into a deeper appreciation of the broader how, how spectrum? Yeah. How does that get the dial moved back to where it was? To Sorry. Your, how does that, that get the dial moved to your twenty percent? Ah. If you see what I mean, from the one to two percent. Because that, that statistic referred not only to the vocal side, I think. So yeah. how, do you, how do we get the whole ship Because there are two issues here. There, there, there's, there is developing musical intelligence in every single child at the right stage of their education. And there is bringing young people back into the concert halls. And all these things have to be done at the same time. Um, in terms of the latter, um, what we're doing with Vocal Futures is we've had a 1,000 young ambassadors who are non-concert goers on our program, and we have surveyed them to death during the induction and what I call the conduction, the Red Bull moment of the actual performance, and the outduction where we give them free tickets to go to concerts to see if they take them up. So we have this data bank led by jo Professor John Sloboda, who's a music psychologist, second to none. And we've learned a lot of things from these young people who have gone through the program with us. We've learned uh, um, um, how to, what they like, why they will come back to, to another concert. For example, um, we said, did you like the Bach? And they said, yes. Would you like to go to another concert? Yes. What about this experience makes you want to go to come to another concert? And this is what really amazed us. They said, to follow an individual performer. So, when you try and follow an individual performer, classical musicians are hopeless. You, you look them up on the internet, there's nothing there. You have no idea what they're, where they're next are. They have no self-awareness of, of self-promotion. So what we're now doing with the Arts Council is going out to the regions, to every single arts organization, and making recommendations to change the contracts of musicians so that all their forthcoming concerts are available on the website of the, of the presenting institution at the click of a button. So that's a direct response to the data we've collected. But that's just one of many recommendations to start bringing in, back in the, the young audiences. And it's wor it works. I mean, we've, you know, we've got this, an amazing um, data bank now that shows that we can really capture and then hold these audiences. Is that geographically quite wide dispersed in the UK, or is it one? one we're starting, we've just done our pilot, three productions, and we start doing the touring, which is our road show to dozens of arts organizations in the regions with this package of recommendations of how they can then engage their local young communities. I and mean, uh, what's interesting about the Voices Futures is, is the, it's, the, it's about the context in which the music is heard, 
not yeah, music, there are many but factors, but that's one of them. Um, which makes you think about why so much. Just to pick one example, if you listen to certain film music, and I mean quite avant-garde film music, in isolation, and you're not somebody who's particularly plugged into classical music, you think it's terrible, in my experience. Mm. But then when you say, well, actually, this goes with this film, it's actually the music for that film, and they sit, you sit the person through the film, mm. they have a completely different sensibility of that music, which tells you that it's, in part, that it's context, mm. and not simply understanding. But great music is great music, and, and I believe in dumbing up what I mean about uh, Susie, I, music. I, I agree with everything you're doing. I think it's marvelous. But I'm a bit cynical about all these experts that tell you all these things because two things stare in my face. Uh, and I did a program with uh, Stephen Fry and James Rhodes once, um, Barbican not so long ago, about uh, the dwindling audience of the classical uh, concert. And our conclusion, or my conclusion, was very simple. Number one is that the form of classical performance has got no interaction or hardly any between the audience and the performance. So they come on, sometimes in a monkey suit, sometimes not. They don't talk to you. You sit in the audience. You read some unreadable, incomprehensible notes. Um, and then they go off. At most, you applaud. And at most, you ask them for a long call. But you never, ever interact with them other than perhaps a bow. Now, you go to a concert, a pop concert, you see exactly the reverse. There is absolute interaction. The performers on a stage is asking you to clap, to dance, and they dance together, they clap together, they sing together. So this is a huge divide between the way in which we are trying to rescue um, classical music in a modern world in which the younger generation are much more attuned to being part of the music performance. That's number one. And number two is that with this world, I mean, that was an event three years ago. Now, you ask people to concentrate for more than half an hour. Eric Smith said yesterday, if you have to switch your phone off for an hour, he bets you that you will go mad. All right, you will go instantly mad. And the point is this, is that people don't have, the younger generation particularly, have that concentration. So if you ask them to come to half a performance of creation, or even worse, come to a concert, that means turning up at 7 o'clock, 7.30, and then not going to bed until 10.30. Now, that's a hugely long interval to ask somebody who is not particularly attuned and already they are prejudiced. So what I'm saying is this. Are we not staring that these two realities, number one, the, 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 the the format of the, of the performance itself, and the dwindling attention span of the younger generation, for whatever reason, rightly or wrongly, uh, especially in the age of the internet, how do we solve these problems? Um, forgetting about all the other psychological uh, theories that people have. I mean, these are staring in my face. I, 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 don't, I don't have that, uh, a solution. The best thing I could do is to say, look, cut the concert in half and only uh, have one hour concerts or half an hour concerts or, or whatever. No, I, I, I fundamentally disagree. Good. Um, and I'll give your case. Fundamentally disagree. So and number one and number two. I'll give you an example. My, um, when I st Matthew, you think the creation is long. The Matthew Passion is three hours and 20 minutes. But you cannot parachute young people from the hood into three and a half hours of Bach. You have to get it into their bloodstream first. And I also disagree that attention spans have diminished. No way. A, a young person can, be, can spend hours focused if, it's the, if they're engaged. Hours and hours and hours. No problem sitting through a long movie. No problem spending hours and hours and hours and hours on a computer game. That's not the point. The point is, there are, there are many things. The point is choice. The point is the alienation of it. Um, I'll give you an example. So my focus group, 50, 50, 45 minutes late, this boy comes in. I only had six kids, so I had to wait for him. Tall black guy, a, he was a 17-year-old, called AJ. Hoodie, 
rucksack. He comes in, he's slapped like this, you know, slapped, the hoodie stays on. He said, well, so what's all this? You know, terrible, terrible attitude. And my heart's in my mouth because I'm about to play him a bit of the bloody Bach, Matthew Passion. And um, so I, cho I choose a bit where the crowd, there's this chord that, that Bach creates which really encapsulates all the ugliness of humanity. All the, the worst aspects of humanity is in this one chord when the crowd shouts Barabbas, release Barabbas. And anyway, I played that very loud. It was a fantastic performance, and I explained the context of him. And this guy, he sat up and he said, man, that is the mother of all music. <laughs> and he came to two performances. I mean, he went through the whole induction, and the inductions are terribly important of the Matthew Passion in that warehouse that I showed you. But we had to induct these young ambassadors, so they were on the edge of their seats, and we had to involve them. That, that You saw the virtual, the virtual choir, the faces on this stage. They actually created that virtual choir themselves, and we projected onto the stage. I'm sorry, Susie. I mean, of course, there are, there are cases like that, but I mean, a, a case like yours, there are, I would say, 10,000 in the reverse. Now, you mentioned in your speech that you want to rescue the declining numbers, especially the younger generation. Correct. So you can't contradict what I've just told you, is that the reality is that there ain't enough younger generation going. I was a governor of the Hong Kong Philharmonic, and when I say we've got to cultivate the young, they said, why? Our attention, uh, our capacity is 95% in every single concert. I said, yes, the same old 20,000 people whose average age is 65. What are they going to do when they die? Now, look, let's just be realistic, okay? The younger generation, you are right, have the attention span to go on internet games and so forth. In China, is, is, is a real problem. So people get sent off to concentration camps, uh, to, to re-education. There are something like 60 million young people who are addicted. But why don't they get addicted to coming to St. Matthew Passion? Now, I don't disagree that, of course, there are young people. I mean, we, uh, as president of the London Bar Society, we have very young people coming, and, uh, and, they, and, they, and they sing the St. Matthew Passion. But what we do is that what we did, what they did, when St. Matthew Passion was performed, namely that at the chorus, you know, we all stood up and sang, and they love it. You know, that's one way in which we can... Yeah, I, th I, I think it. it needs multiple approaches. And, but I, thi I think that one has to be very, very careful. Um, I mean, other music, we are way behind. That's the problem. Classical musicians themselves have no awareness. And this is what we found out in the five years I've been doing this work, is that other genres have, are far further ahead than we are. Jazz, for example. Many of it, I mean, I noticed you nodding at the back. What, was your, what is your view? <laughs> now use your microphone because you are being recorded. You might be famous. Well, I presented television regionally in China for five years. I'm pretty sure I can deal with it. Um, I think, uh, you know, as a, as a father of, of, of four young children, it's something that I think is very, very important is uh, there's a very strong self-awareness that I think it's very difficult to, uh, to, to sort of get over. Um, from a number of aspects. One is, is personality driven. There's a, I think there's a lot of people who, because of a, a state of uncoolness of, of classical music, it's not as cool as Katy Perry or whoever happens to be in the charts at the moment. It's a state of, you know, very often, in this case, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing this uh, single uh, case study, that, that young man, this tall young man who came in late, he changed because he wasn't with his posse in the room. Were his... But he brought his mates, that's the thing. He brought his mates. And, and the other thing I found was that with a thousand kids like AJ, when they hear the music, they love it. But it's the context. It is so many factors. It's not just one. It's not just the interaction. It's not just the attention span. It's not just that they don't know what to do and the, you know, they, don't, they don't understand the language. It's many, many, many aspects. And I think I, I, I don't agree that we, 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 we should in any way compromise or dumb, dumb down. I think that... It's a, my analogy is bringing the horse to water and make sure it's thirsty when it gets to the water and then watch it mm. grow its Red Bull wings. And we've seen it happen. But classical musicians have to be part of this. Arts, all the, uh, the presenting bodies have to be part of this. You can't expect kids to 
to put up with the low production standards of classical music when they used to get Lady Gaga. You know, it, it's just, you know, a, a lot has to change. And actually, I have to say that there is a real zeitgeist in America, actually, more than anywhere, of young companies really breaking through glass, glass ceilings of performance practice, not the big orchestras, but smaller groups who are experimenting ways of presenting uh, music in unusual spaces, and they are bringing in audiences. So I think, I think it's, there's, it's a big and complex area. Uh, sure, but I mean, we are talking about classical music. So the next question is this, why, why classical music? Let them like what they like, let them be. I mean, why, why say because we so you're need facing the death we of classical you. music there? Yeah, <laughs> no, because when Michael Jackson died, everybody said to me that he was a genius. Now, the only response I gave was if Michael Jackson was a genius, where does Brahms sit? Exactly. But, uh, but, but they don't agree. They say, you, you don't understand. Okay? No, it's but about education. It is about education. And it's about, you so see. So they're wrong. They're wrong. Well, I, I don't like to tell other people they're wrong when they talk about exactly. cultural no issues. But in, in this, um, I have a deep seeded, uh, very narrow minded point of view that they are wrong. I, I think you'll find there's a, a lot of things that you'll find when people have, have dealt with classical music from a young age, including uh, church music or indigenous folk music, you will find that in the room they are the more polite people, the better dressed people, the more vibrant people, the people who just sit up more nicely and, and than other think, people. I don't think it is good enough. Better we're, dressed, we're talking about hair. We're talking about sus the susceptible and giving them the opportunity to engage with great music at the highest level. That's what we need to do. That's what we have to do. And that's what I hope the message that I put across. I don't think it's good enough to say, well, let them be. Because when they do come, I'm not talking about every, forcing every young person to listen to classical music. I'm talking about that susceptible, the, the person I was when I was that age. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity. Um, yes, young people have changed, but not so much, I find, that one, once they do have the opportunity to experience, within the modern framework of what a young person is today, it changes them. And Susie, it's, it's I'm with you 100%. I spent my life trying to encourage younger people in loving music, in knowing music, and so forth. When Classic FM came up, I also turned my nose up because I was a Radio 3 fan. And I started listening to it, first of all, without telling people secretly in the bathroom. And then, what the hell, I told everybody. <laughs> and when I get into the car, I listen to classic music, uh, classic FM. Now, it's getting worse because there are too many adverts. It's become a victim of its own success. You know, six million people in a week, that's a lot. Now, I have known a lot of people who, as a result of listening to classical mu uh, classic FM, has actually got in themselves into classic, classical music. Now, I don't mind that. But now look what happened to Radio 3. Radio 3 has suddenly woken up to the fact that they cannot pay, play a Mahler symphony or Sibelius symphony in the morning and expect people to listen to it. And now there's a great controversy about their thumbing down, if that's the right word, of trying to copy some of the classic FM antics of playing excerpts, God forbid, uh, or, or cutting off uh, you know, a piece of music in, in mid-phrase. Now, but that is the reality of life is that you've got to move. And I don't, for one, criticize at all. And I don't, for one, want to thumb down the magic of classical music. But the fact of the matter is that you've got to change your entire attitude and education of this sacred subject. And if you have to prostitute yourself by giving out excerpts and, and, and sound bites, for want of a better word, uh, you, why not? I got into classical music at the age of 15 without knowing who Bach was, Beethoven was, simply by listening to the opening bars of the third movement of Brahms' third. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. That was suddenly opened up to me. Now, a lot of people probably heard it, and nothing, nothing touches them, and, and that's it. But uh, a lot of us do it. And... Um, we, we've got to tell people in a non-patronizing way what it means for Bach to have written the re music he, he did. Beethoven, Brahms. And then you look at this 
dreadful, superficial crap you hear in modern music. Um, and then they realize, you know, the, the, the real power of music. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm all, I'm not arguing against you. I'm passionately. Has never really understood how to compete. And it didn't really particularly much have to compete. No and chance. Susie's point, in the 19th century, people played at home. That's what you did. Um, salons at home, whatever. Now, this type of um, music has to compete, and it has to understand the channels through which it needs to reach people. And it has to understand the channels on which and through which people uh, absorb entertainment, culture, whatever. And I think this brings into question very seriously performance. What is the future of performance in a world where so much music is consumed electronically on personal handheld devices, whatever you might, you know, whatever else. And that's where, to your point, David, about, um, I think both of you made the same point, actually, about connecting and um, dismantling the invisible barrier between the people in monkey suits on a concert stage. I mean, Mark Elder with the Halle and other orchestras does this very well, actually, if you, I'm sure you know him. Um, I mean, I went to, I was in Chicago at the time working, and he did a fantastic thing with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra with Shostakovich IV, which, as you probably know, and for those who don't know, it's actually rather a difficult piece of music to listen to. It's one of Shostakovich's most difficult symphonies. But with the help of some visuals and some narrative and storytelling, the thing became just a completely different piece of music and a completely different experience Absolutely. through something synesthetic, which was clever. Um, that will only get you so far, I think, though. That's the problem, because... But it needs because multiple approaches. Yeah. I, think, I think that no one way is the right way. This way. But I think the, the fatal thing, which will herald a decline, is dumbing down of every, any form. Young people recognize quality more than they ever have. The best music, the best performances, the highest production values. Then you can hook them in. But, but the temptation to dumb down, to patronize, it will be the death of great music. Uh, I, I don't think, I, I think everybody agrees with you. No, nobody would, I mean, who would dare to thumb down Bach? I mean, he, he would have to be put in the loony bin immediately. <laughs> uh, but the last thing I would say, because time is up, is that I think, Isabel, you should enter X Factor. You'll win it. And uh, <laughs> you, will, you will give classical music a, a, a very good name. But li listen, uh, thank you very much, all of you, for coming today. And in particular, I want to thank Susie personally and on your behalf uh, for giving that very passionate, uh, very erudite, uh, half of which I didn't understand. <laughs> the, only thing I, I the only thing I understood was that I can cook my books now uh, next to a high wavelength. That, that's the only thing I learned, <laughs> uh, and that's giving me an idea. Uh, but um, um, it, is, it is wonderful to have somebody passionate about maintaining the excellent standard of what we have come to appreciate as music lovers, the extraordinary heritage uh, that has been left to Western civilization in terms of music which is really indescribable and magical and mysterious, and uh, we don't really understand it other than having to experience it, as you say, which is the secret of how that music transcends and cuts through our, our, our emotions. And, um, and th there is no time when we feel love or anger without hearing some fictional sound in our mind. I mean, when you fall in love in the summer or you, 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 you agonize over something else, that there's always a tune going on in the background. Um, sometimes we don't even know what it is, but music comes to mind. And when we are seeking solace, we listen to music. When we are happy, we listen to music. I remember going to see The Exorcist once. I absolutely scared out of my wits. <laughs> I came straight home and turned on music uh, by Mozart just to cheer me up, to calm me down. Uh, but listen, Susie, thank you very much. You are doing an extraordinary thing. You've got three things going. God knows what else you're going to do. Uh, soon the whole of Britain will be singing for you. And I hope that one day uh, you're going to have the largest concert ever. How many people have you had? the largest uh, ensemble.
Well, I've conducted the Messiah in the Albert Hall with 2,000 children. All right. Well, is um, that a capacity? That's not a huge amount. We're, going, we're thinking in terms of 8,000 children for Berlioz's Te Deum. Where? Recreating in, well, we have Wembley. to find a venue. Oh, <laughs> two. Because when Berlioz did it, they were, he would not have been very popular with the health and safety people in St. Paul's. <laughs> they were packed up to the rafters. Will you join me warmly in thanking Susie for coming today, and in particular, Harry and Isabel for giving us that wonderful rendition of uh, magical music. Thank you.